one of the main things we do after we meet eat a meal together every single time the way we start our gatherings at all our houses is we start with what we call Jesus stories and that just looks like hey let's go around the room real quick and just tell of one time this week that you got to speak the name of Jesus to somebody and the first three or four months of that was the most painfully awkward thing you've ever sat through in your entire life and I would just I would just let it be crickets we would sit there people like all of a sudden have to retie their shoes and then slowly like we I started being able to like encourage our people about the priesthood of the believer and like if you're not telling people about Jesus who is for the first time in my life I understand why Israel is important this book has been fearfully wonderfully made there's intelligent design if we just put our head in the sand it would just get worse. Inaction is action. When people say, like, why do you think persecution hasn't come to the American church? My answer is because we are not a threat to the devil. I believe that right now, especially in the days that we're living in, is that we need to be a quarry ten boot type of people. We're in a war with the unseen also, and the enemy will get in any way he can. Well... Buckle up for this one. This is the Gather Podcast. I'm Aaron Schust. Joshua Aaron is here, and today is our. Uh, we have our guest, Jesse, the Reverend Reeves. You're gonna love this guy. Oh my goodness. Um, we'll, we'll talk about him and his his past and his his history and his exploits. He's become a dear friend of both Joshua and I. Um, written so many songs that everybody sings even in yeah. your sleep. But uh, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Lots of topics, a lot of deep conversations that are had uh, today. You may have not have met him or heard of him, but you've heard his songs. Oh, yeah. And he brings, the, he brings the shalom y'all to shalom. Uh, you're going to enjoy Jesse Reeves today. Very nice. And on this episode of The Gather Podcast. So here we are again, Joshua Aaron, myself, Aaron Schust, and today our friend, the Reverend Jesse Reeves. How's it going, Jesse? <sighs> the crowd roars. Hey, right, stop, guys. Stop. I can't even, I can't even hear y'all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Welcome. You're in Texas, yes? Home? Yes, sir. Excellent. I see the hat. Very Austin. nice. Austin. Yep. I've only been to Austin one time, and it was only the airport. So we need to remedy that. Actually, we, we have You're plans. Coming. I, I yes, in the very yeah. near future, we, yep. we we will remedy that. I'm looking forward. And to I've that. only been once, and that's to see you, Jesse. So, and it both was, of, I guess and both of our purposes, I guess you know, are, you know, in times was, recent. No, we did write a really good song. Yes, we did. Praise God. Oh yes, and I, and yeah. I got a chance to listen to it be sung at the Garden Tomb. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Oh. We'll talk about all kinds of good things today. We're going to talk about you've been you've been around the world a couple times. Um, we'd love to hear some of that. And you've been writing songs for a long time. I learned something about you just talking to you last week about the Air Force. We could talk about how oh, yeah. sometimes the plans that you might have go a different direction when God's directing steps. I actually and, just uh, love watching Joshua's face when you mentioned that. You didn't Air know I was Force. in the Air Force, Joshua? No. I'm just kidding. You probably told me, and I'm like, Shh, I don't care. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't remember. Man, um, this will be. I'm, I'm, yeah, we won't go here. Yeah, maybe we will go here. My my. Son, the reason why this conversation came up is that my oldest son um, has has is taking steps. He's in he's in the uh, the Civil Air Patrol. He's going into his senior year, um, and so you know he's got his dreams. And, and as a kid, I was I was I always thought that the Air Force would be pretty awesome. So we're talking Air Force stuff. Uh, and and then, Jesse, you're like, well, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but. Yeah, that, that's I was, what I was going to do my whole life. My my dad was in the Air Force in Vietnam, and I grew up like all I was going to do is go to the Air Force. Like I, I was the kid that put together model airplanes, and I wanted hey, to fly F-16s. I did too. Yeah. I mean, wow. I wanted to fly F-16s. When I was a sophomore in high school, I already had my letter of recommendation from a senator here in Texas. As a sophomore? As a sophomore to go to uh, the Air Force Academy. And here's... Joshua, That's incredible. I, I told uh, Aaron this, but uh, the the uh, cutoff to fly F-16s is 6-1. And 
in one summer. I went through puberty really late. I went okay. through. I went through puberty after my sophomore year and in between my sophomore and junior year, I went from five, seven, 185 to six, four, 185 in one summer. <laughs> I just went <laughs> and, and I, too tall. I was too tall. That's nuts. And I was actually devastated. Sure. That I wasn't going to be able to go fly airplanes and yeah, you're, 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 be too tall. Can't they tall. adjust the pedals? I mean, what in the world? <laughs> you, you, can't no fit, you can't fit the in the cockpit. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're you're used to being hunched over. You're so tall. I mean, can't you yeah. just, you know? But just, yeah. from five, oh, that's terrible. Five feet, seven inches to six feet, four inches. In one in, summer. In one summer. That's what was the age? How old were you again? I was 15, yeah. 15? That's remarkable. Yeah. Did you, like, experience all, like, the growth pains and, like, the bone plate yeah. pain and the joint yeah, stuff? Yeah, what? I slept. I literally slept all summer. It was like wow. I was hibernating. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> it's not healthy. I, ended up, I, I mean, since then I have back problems. I have. Uh, I've had a collapsed lung because I grew too fast. Like oh, all, wow. all the things. Wow. This is not what we're talking about today, by the way. But I, I, is, I think it is, it now. is man. It is. Because I think it, I mean, I, I already alluded to it. It fits in the category of, of man having, you know, having, what's, what's the verse? Help me oh, out, guys. Oh, man plans um, his ways, but God orders Lord, his steps. Boom. Yeah, yeah, the Lord directs his steps or orders his steps. And so oh, I mean, how many yeah. times have we come to that crossroads? I heard Laura's story uh, talk about what you think, how does she say this? You're on, you're on a road and something happens, like like the way of life, the, the plan, the path of life. And something happens and you think, oh, man, this is a detour. This is taking me away from my destination. And then time passes and you look back in the rearview mirror and you realize it, it was never a detour. It was always the way. You just yeah. felt like it was a detour, you know? So. Man, so that yeah. you said it devastated you. And, yeah, but, and so I, I ended up going, I went to a Christian concert. I was raised like in a Christian home. I, my parents were elders, but we went to a, a Bible church, which, you know, is, is Father, Son, Holy Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I hadn't experienced anything like charismatic or, or fun or exciting. <laughs> <laughs> And I went to a Christian concert and uh, I actually got saved, which is crazy. I mean, that's all another story. I'd been baptized when I was younger because I thought I was saved, but I didn't know Jesus. I mm. met Jesus when I was 15 and I just prayed that night. I was like, God, whatever you want me to do, the answer is yes. Wow. I, I wow. never pray. I never prayed, God, I want to be a songwriter. I never prayed, God, I want to travel the world. I, I just said, whatever you want me to do, the answer is yes. The, the, it's so crazy. It's, the band that was playing when I got saved was na was called Judah. They were like a local uh, rock band in like the Dallas Fort Worth area. And two weeks later, I'm walking through the mall with my mother, and we there used to be a store called Structure. Do you remember that store? Vaguely, it's kind of like a it was like, like a Express for men. Okay, yeah. All yeah. Right. So I went in there to like get a pair of jeans or something with my mom and the lead singer of Judah worked at structure. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and I just was like, Oh my God. I was starstruck, you know, right. Uh, as looking back, it's funny, but I literally was, I was like, so I told him, I was like, bro, I got, I got saved at your concert the other day. And oh, he was like, I was oh, going to ask awesome. if he knew that's, that's yeah, I told him in structure. And I was yeah. like, Hey, I said, this is weird, but I, I, play bass and so if you the the singer also played bass he was okay. kind of like sting i said if you ever wanted to just sing and have somebody else play bass i'd love to audition for your band and he was like bro i've been praying about that for two weeks whoa and so i went and auditioned for the band so two weeks from the time i got saved at a judah concert i was in judah <laughs> <laughs> no way <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I did that all the way through college. We all went to college together. We signed a record deal, um, went to Nashville. They changed our name to Between Thieves because, of course, yes. Yeah, Judah was like cheesy. And, uh, which okay. is not, by the way, but <laughs> apparently yeah. in that era, it was, it was in the great. era, it was, yeah. right? Okay. Actually, what's ironic is yesterday we studied the story of Judah and Tamar at church. Yeah, that's yeah. the craziest story in the Bible. Maybe. Yeah, it, it feels like an inserted chapter. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, and by the way, this happened. It's unbelievable. Yeah, like the the meat that came out of that. Anyway, all that to say, like, 
I did that all the way through college. Uh, and then in 97 is when I graduated from Dallas Baptist University. And I met my wife on a mission trip and we were like, let's get married. And so I figured I would I needed to make more than $16,000 a year, which is what I was making in Judah. Right. So I quit and Janet was teaching school at the time. That's like 30 grand a year, you know? So I kind of had a sugar mama. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't need to work. <laughs> Um, with, with, and you had a, your uh, your story. Uh, if I'm not confusing this with another story, the the mission trip, uh, like you knew you knew right away, right? Oh Where yeah, was, that, that was pretty I mean, quick. that's part of the story. I went to the Ukraine um, right, before yeah. my senior year in college. I went. I was going on a trip to the Ukraine, and this is 1996 when anybody could go into the airport, like. I don't know if y'all remember pre nine eleven, but it was easy. You, didn't, you didn't have to have a boarding pass. You could just yeah. go into the airport. Just stick your switchblade in your, in your shirt yeah. pocket. I mean, Kevin McAllister just walked onto an airplane back then and flew to New York. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> really? Right. From home alone? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. So yeah, that's part of the story is I was sitting on the airport I was sitting on the ground in DFW airport and with my buddy, Jimmy, he was the guitar player in Judah. And I'm we looking getting, at a picture of your band right now. I'm just laughing. Just look at come it. On, baby Jesse over here. Everybody look it up. We'll, we'll, <laughs> put, it up show, we'll put it in the I, show notes. Y'all, y'all, have, y'all have no clue. Like we were huge. We sold, we sold dozens and dozens of records. <laughs> 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 so anyway, Jimmy and I were going to go to the Ukraine uh, to lead worship at this like student conference they were having. And we're sitting on the floor in DFW airport and this girl walks in and her brother is carrying her bags and she's just like, you know, giving him the business where to put the bags and all this right. stuff. And I leaned over to Jimmy and I said, Hey, do you see that girl over there? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I'm going to marry her. Come on. And he was like, yeah, whatever. That is a true story. And he will tell you the same story. I believe it. I get on the plane. The first plane was to Frankfurt, Germany. And my ticket was next to hers. No. Yeah. She Talk said, about the vine, man. You yeah. already you already said it. I'm going to marry that girl. And then this is not Southwest we're talking about, open seating. No, that's like, yes. a, that's <laughs> like a triple seven. You know, there's 400 people on this on right, the yeah. plane. And my, my chair was next to hers. And so our first conversation was 11 hours long. And, right. And ended up, she was actually going on the same trip. So we spent... We okay. spent like Come three on. weeks together in the Ukraine and that we would do the student conference. Well, they, they didn't have anything planned for kids. So Janet and I would take all the kids with a translator and we would go out in the parking lot and play games with them and teach them a little Aww. Bible story. And talk about a shared experience, man. I was like, I, I love this woman. She loves Jesus. She loves children. Like this is it. So yeah, all that to say, man, we didn't know where we were going to go. We came came home um, after my senior year. Um, we got married in 97, and I quit playing for Judah. And we got married July 19th in 97. In August, I got a call from this country boy in Grand Saline, Texas, named Chris Tomlin that I'd never heard of and nobody else had ever heard of because he was – he had just graduated from Texas A&M and he was like, Hey man, no, you don't know me, but I got your number from somebody. I'm looking for a bass player. And I was like, I, I can't bro. I just got married. And you mm. know, he was like, well, I need somebody this weekend. Can you play this weekend? And I was like, sure. I'll play. Weekend. Weekend. Last words. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. So, uh, <laughs> we, I went and played and, uh, I mean, I said this earlier, being raised in the Bible church, we, I didn't know what worship music was actually in 97, Aaron, you, you know, this, there was no such thing as worship music. No, there wasn't my, my, not, let me interject here real quick, just to solidify that point. 1997 was exactly when I was in college. Uh, I, I graduated, I should have graduated in 97, but I did the four and a half year plan. But around that time, somebody said, Hey ma'am, Tuesday night, we're having a praise and worship time. Do you want to come? I'm like, yeah, sounds great. What is it? Like, yeah. What does that mean? I, and I was uh, raised in yeah. the church, and they were like, "I don't know. I guess we just, we sing some songs. There's a band, and and no one preaches." 
Like we just worship for an hour. Like, wow, I, I remember hearing great. Michael W. Smith talk about it, an interview years and years ago. He said, I, did, I didn't want to worship that new wor- – I didn't want to join that new worship bandwagon because it was, it was a new thing. He didn't know what it was. Like he, he, was, he was an artist. Yeah. And okay. he didn't know what that was as well. It's interesting that you just brought that up because that actually was the kind of one of the things that I all right pause. I'm coming back to Michael W. Smith. All roads lead to Michael W. Smith. I'm gonna get there. Oh really? Minute. They do. Okay. Well, I'm gonna get there in a minute. So, <laughs> so I didn't. I, being raised in the Bible Church, we had the guy that stood up in the front, you know, and did this. The, Slice the yeah. bread, move it over. Slice the bread, move <laughs> <Yeah>. it over. <laughs> there, there was no such thing as a worship leader. They we had music ministers. You know, and I didn't know what it was. So I said, yes, told Chris, I go play. We went to Lufkin, Texas and played an event called Hot Hearts. Hot they, were, they were kind of like a, like kind of like true love weights rallies, okay. you know, in the late nineties. Anyway, it's the first time I'd ever heard worship was playing it. Playing and, it. Yeah. And Chris had a song called We Fall Down. That he, had, that he had written. And I remember standing on stage playing We Fall Down, and I felt like the skies parted and the Holy Spirit descended on me like a dove. And <laughs> I felt like God said to me, This is what I've been training you for. Like all the things, all the steps were just training you to be a worship leader. Playing with and Judah and, and, and not being in the Air Force and all the things all led the things. up wow. to that moment. And I just said, okay, Lord, that's great. And so I started playing for Chris that day and I played for him for 17 years. Wow. And we had no clue. I mean, literally, we had no clue what God was going to do. We just loved Jesus. We loved the church. We wanted to write songs for the church. So started, we, you know, started playing with Chris at this time, there was no worship music on radio ever. And Chris wrote a song called forever. And Michael W. Smith Uh, recorded it. That's right. Oh yeah. When, when Michael W. Smith recorded forever, Radio started playing it. Interesting, because now so so Michael is an is an established voice in Christian, Christian radio. Radio, yeah, for right. decades, and that's you know give thanks to the Lord, right? Our yeah, God and King. Yeah, love is straight love. from yeah. Psalm one thirty six. Is that somewhere around there? Yeah, somewhere in there. Or is that is that your? Uh, I might be getting confused on the psalm, but yes, it's it's straight from the scripture. Yeah. So anyway, that literally. Yeah. That that is somebody would probably argue with me, but before that, if they played worship music on the radio, it was on Sunday morning from like eight to eight fifteen. Okay, <laughs> you know? yeah. As you get and, ready for church, here's Sandy that, Petty. That's right. And then yeah. when Michael did uh, Forever, it's kind of, radio was kind of like, whoa, this has a good response, and that kind of started opening the door for worship leaders to get songs on the radio. I don't think I realized that wow. that's how that rolled out. Was that on his, that, that orange album? The, um, I'm forgetting what he called those with the, like the, the Michael W. Smith, yeah. the, hand, the hands and the orange. Yes. He did like a live concert up in Canada and it yes. blew my mind. Yes. That was yeah. it. Wow. So that so, it's, it's, it's incredible how that opened the doors for us to not, I don't want to say consume worship because mm-hmm. that sounds really industrial and it, it can be industrial but but for i mean going back to your experience jesse performing or playing executing we fall down while the people worshiped and and you had that experience like this is different mm-hmm. this it was different. different because it was it was all like everybody in the audience was like tuned in vertically and it yeah. wasn't about us mm. and i wanted to be a part of that I wanted to be a part of making music that was not about us and being in a room of people where people aren't looking at the stage. They're just, everybody's worshiping. Yeah. Right. Mm. I mean, I don't know if we want to get into that at all. That has changed. I'd love to get into that. Uh Uh We we got a lot of things we could get into and and, and I'll tell you, I'll say this in advance. We either talk about all of it now or we got to have you back and talk about it. Yeah. 
you know. Okay. Um, you, or both. Yeah, all of it you, and then all, all of it more. Well, I was just going to say, you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, Not To Us, which I think was on Chris's second album, which, which was a song that we played when I was leading worship in Atlanta in early 2000s incessantly, Not To Us, But To Your Name Be The Glory. Yeah. Like what a fantastic, you know, it's, and, and Joshua, I'll say the same thing about, about you as you, as you write. One of my favorite things about um, your songs, Josh, and Chris's songs, which, jo which Jesse, you have had a ton of um, input into over the years, but like the, the, the beauty of the simple choruses, I write complex mm. choruses and then I have to pare them down to some, oh, some degree yeah, of simplicity. Oh yeah, you're such a deep writer. Oh my well, gosh, I, it's amazing. Thank you. But sometimes like you allocate those if, if, if you have anything worth saying, allocate it to the verse and then have something that the chorus, you know, going back to the, the, the idea of the Greek, the Greek plays where like the, 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 the verses, so to speak, were really complicated. And then the chorus was like four people standing on the left that would say, yes, in this case, you know, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Oh. Right. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. It's the, it's yeah. the chorus. It's the thing that we can just wrap our, our oh, minds yeah. and our hearts around and repeat. Um, I mean, it goes back to the, you know, his love endures forever. I know, I know, I just, I looked it up. It was Psalm 118. Thank um, you, 118. Um, but just this, the idea of call and response and just that simple way of singing that brings people in and reminds me of, you know, when the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It just said, he, he is good, his love endures forever. That was the whole song. And then the Holy Spirit came down. Um, but I, I'm just, I'm just going over your story in my head. And one thing that stood out so far is that, See, I'm such I'm such an ADHD. I'm like I'm like somewhere else, even though I'm still in subject. When you were 15, you, you gave your life to the Lord. Didn't you say that was the year you grew like a foot? Yes, it was. <laughs> that all, a little something to do with it. 15 was hard for me, man. <laughs> the Holy Spirit came in, and you just grew a foot tall in a year. Um, I but, don't know which one happened first. I'm, <laughs> I'm on, but yeah, that was 15 was rough. What stood out to me, though, was that your desire to know exactly the calling of God uh, at an early age. Like, God, I, want, I don't care what it is. I just want, I want to follow your will perfectly. And that was my prayer at about the same age, maybe, maybe even younger. Just I, I can't remember not praying that like I, when I was saved. Like, God, I just want to serve you. I don't want to just serve you. Tell me exactly the path, you know. So it's, it's neat how pretty obvious God made it for you, even though you wanted to be a pilot. Um, the path that he would have you on. And then fast forward to today, you know, we're talking about Chris Tomlin and he wrote all these amazing songs. What people might not know is a lot of those big songs, You, your pen was on those songs as well, like How Great Is Our God, Jesus Messiah, um, and so many, so many others. So um, well, I'm looking at both of you right now and you just mentioned How Great Is Our God. Um, and cause at least this is where you are on my screen. Um, oh yeah. Jessica, I know you had a hand in writing that and Joshua, you, uh, you took that to the Hebrew speaking world and, and even- yeah. I mean, just the first time I heard you sing that song, I just, I just had the, the mind blown conversation of here's a song that I've been singing for two decades and now I'm hearing it in the biblical language, you know, and that was just like, whoa, this is just the importance. So talk about that song for a second. Well, I, I mean, I can, okay. So 97 started playing worship. Uh, we, you know, we, you don't make any money at first. We've all, oh, been, yeah. all been down. So you play oh, yeah. summer, you play summer camps, right? And we would play, right. we would play like 13 summer camps every summer. And that's where you make the bulk of your money. And I taught elementary school during the year. I taught, wow. uh, I taught third grade for two years. And then I taught second grade too. I was about years. to ask you which subject, but that's all the subjects. That's all yeah. the subjects. <laughs> and hey, that's my education level right there about third grade. Yeah. Right <laughs> In, uh, my fourth year of teaching elementary school, we got asked to go on tour with Delirious. Come on, oh and, man! Wow. And I, I mean, Martin Delirious, and Stu, they, oh my god, they were they were heroes, right? Yes. And, yes. So I went, I went on, I went on that tour, and I missed forty days of school as a teacher. And Did my principal was okay with it because my wife Janet was my full time sub. Oh, look at that. Okay. Um, and and so she was like, yeah, it's fine. And I never went back. I never went back to teaching. Right. And so it was that was all about this time. We do that. We do uh, summer camps. And we we wrote How Great Is Our God like for summer camp. And that's your point. Come on. Is 
we just wanted a simple chorus mm-hmm. that you know junior high and high school students could catch on to. Yep. Yeah. And it wasn't trying to be cool. It was trying mm-hmm. to just be something simple that people could grab on to. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. remember the first time we played it was at a at a summer camp. And it I don't know <laughs> have you seen the Babylon B article where it talks about the worship leader that gets caught in the vortex between the chorus and the bridge <laughs> on how great is our no. God and he can't get out of it? <laughs> it's actually really funny. That's hysterical. But that happened uh, the first time we played it. Like we finished the song and the the kids went back into name above all names. Like, okay, well, and you're catch up with them and you we'd end that and then the kids would be like, How great is that? And it's just like literally I remember Chris and I looking at each other like that song's got something on it. Something on it. But yep. But you did. We didn't know, you know. How could yeah. you know? Right. So, yeah. Fast forward to what you're talking about. I mean, this was just, you know, four years ago, five years ago. Somebody sends me a a link of this Jewish dude, you know, walking around the walls of you know out, out of Jer- Jerusalem, singing "How Great Is Our God" in Hebrew. I remember, I don't know who showed it to me. Maybe it was Misha, but I remember just like weeping, Mm. like watching this. And I was like, I got to meet that guy. Like, I want to meet that dude. And, and then here we are. My goodness. Wow. It's, I think about this song. It it actually, it was a, a, the song that, Gave me a career, really. When you think about it, um, me, me you too. Know. High five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had been a songwriter. Even my first album, I did. I don't talk to people about it. It was called Bo Yeshua. I did one song that I wrote because I'm like nobody's going to want to sing any songs I wrote. Um, hmm. And then I was doing my album, You Are Holy, and I I heard I heard How Great Is Our God, and Chris had done. Um, I don't think you were with Chris anymore at that point, right? I think no, you're- the World Edition. I was. We were at the World Edition, so I heard yeah. the World Edition, and it was all these different languages, and I felt like this huge mantle, like the song ends, you know, all these languages, and, and it was zero Hebrew, and it was no judgment on Chris Tom because I feel like I'm the people, my friends, some of my friends in Nashville call me Jew Tom, Chris, Jewish Chris Tom, <laughs> <laughs> because I sing that song. Uh, anyways, uh, when he finished, I just felt like, oh my gosh. This at that point it was the number one worship song in the world, and and I it just thought still might be, it was still might be. I I just I I don't want to say I thought I just almost knew I need to do this in Hebrew. It's already it was already sung in Hebrew, you know, in among our our congregations. In it was Gadol Adonai or Gadol Elohai, and um, so I, I it, was sev- it was several different ways. I had a few friends I called them. Hey, well, what do we think is the best way we can consolidate the one- ways we've been singing in Israel? And I just kind of raced, just like I did with the blessing when that came out. I just knew the only two songs that I, the big songs I covered, I, both of them, I just knew I absolutely had to do. It was like a calling. I had to sing it in Hebrew, and that's how I felt like with "How Great Is Our God." And and of course, we had to do it in uh, in, in Jerusalem because I felt like it represented the nations are worshiping, but the the gospel came out of Israel. 2000 years ago and it's come around the world the fullness of the gentiles and it, it needs to come back to israel so i felt like because that song represented kind of you know the nation's worshiping it need, i needed to bring it back to israel and uh i'm glad i did i'm glad i did and of course it wouldn't be the same without the great yolon cherniak playing uh the the t- persian tar and even that like i just played on my guitar just that little riff on my guitar um, that really made it a little more different, but um, I'm so glad you wrote that song. And um, we we serve it's 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 as simple as that. We serve a great God. Um, all other gods are are worthless, dead, uh, but our God's alive, and it's so simple. But it speaks to the greatness of Him, and the nations need to need to know that, not just will know that, but need to know that now. Amen. You guys wrote "Come and See" together for Joshua for your last album. Uh, talk yes. about the writing, the writing, the writing process of that. Well, I, I guess I'm a little bit more of a chorus guy, and um, I, again, the simple songwriter guy. Um, I just, I just had this. Uh, I, we're about to do the live at the Garden Tomb album. We get, kept getting pushed off because of uh, the big C. We were, pla- we were planning on filming the Garden Tomb one BC before COVID. Um, 
and it just kept getting pushed off. And then I just before, not so long before we uh, picked the date, uh, I, I told Jesse, I want to write this song from the table to this tomb uh, that tells the story from the table to the tomb. And yeah, Jesse and I got together and Jesse's just, it was so amazing how he's, uh, he just puts words. He's like, how about if we do this? And it's just, it, it, was, it was amazing to watch him for the first time to write with him together and to see how um, we could tell that story together uh, from the table to the tomb and then sing it at the garden tomb was, was just, it's wild. It's wild. It's, it's, I mean, I'm biased, but I, I love that song on that record. Oh like yeah. It's, it's one of my fa- I mean, there's a bunch of good ones, but it's, it's one of the few it's... songs that we, I've been a part of writing for a place or for an event for a specific location and not yeah. just for a you, location, the garden to be, tomb, you know, <laughs> for you to be standing in front of the garden tomb saying the same words that the angel said, come and see, like <laughs> yeah. he, he's not here. And he's still <laughs> yeah. not there. You know what right. I mean? It's just like, I don't yep. know, that blew my mind that God allowed you to do that. And It was, it was cool to have right. you in Israel uh, hanging out uh, with Janet and me, hanging out with my family and getting to travel Israel together. That was awesome. Yeah, and then, that was an anniversary trip for you, right, Jesse? It was. That was, that was 25. Nice. Janet's always wanted to go to Israel. And, I mean, this sounds bad, but I've just had no desire. Hmm. I, I, I think maybe it's ignorance. I just, I, it's, it's a cross between ignorance and everybody that goes to Israel comes back and you have to watch a dang slideshow for like <laughs> an hour and you're just like, oh, there's more rocks. Oh, look, there's some rocks on top of rocks that used to be something else. <laughs> I don't know. I just didn't want to go. And uh, Janet really wanted to go for our 25th. All right. This is how, this, this will tell you just how, how wicked my heart is. <laughs> I found out about a tattoo parlor in inside <laughs> the inside the Joppa Gate. Razook called Razooks. Yeah, I've Razook, heard of them. been there. Yeah, well, for those look, listening, look, Razooks look, is no, too I, old. I, get <laughs> I did. <laughs> I know Razooks you did. is the oldest tattoo parlor in the world. It's been right inside the Joppa Gate for seven hundred years since thirteen hundred. They're on the twenty ninth generation of Razooks tattooing. And I found out about that, and I was like, okay, Janet, we can go. And I, <laughs> I booked my appointment at Razooks before I booked flights. <laughs> that's like, incredible. Let's see if Razooks will have me first. So literally, oh, my that's, word. that's why like, I was ex- – Do what? That's I'd why like I was excited. I, I, did I tell you about Razooks? You – we I did think talk it was, about um, it. Michael Farron is the Farron, one that told Michael Farron, Yeah, because right, him and yeah. I talked about that year, a couple of years ago. Got, I don't know if you can see. That's, he got that's one. Sig- yeah, Gregory. That's, uh, that's, or is that, is that Michael? It is? It's St. George slaying a dragon. Sorry, George. Jesse, yeah, so you got to flex that thing for us. You got to flex it for us. That was flexed. <laughs> <laughs> <That flexed. laughs> <laughs> you know, like the Lord is my shepherd in Hebrew, yeah. right? The, the Lord yeah, is my yeah, shepherd in Psalm 23. I don't know how to show you this one. It's on his buttocks. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I can't. I can't. It's on my forearm right there. My oh, forearm. Yeah. I can't show you. Well, yeah, maybe, we, maybe we can put that in the show links as well if, you, if you're curious. But yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah. so that, that was my reason for going. And funny, it was like, it was the most <laughs> hilarious, amazing place I've ever been. I mean, you, you guys know it's near and dear to your heart. I was an idiot. You're talking about it, Jerusalem or Razooks? Or I'm Israel? talking about Israel. <laughs> Israel. Period. <laughs> okay. Just to clarify. Yeah. Razooks was just like, it became insignificant once I got there. How about and that? Honestly, Josh was a buddy who y'all just had on here. Haim. Mm-hmm. Haim I knew we were going, I knew we were going to steer there. I, I was hoping we would. Go yes. ahead. Ha- Haim. Uh, okay. So I called Joshua before we went and I was like, hey, Janet wants to come. Like, we, which guide service do you recommend? He was like, Oh, you just got to go with my buddy. Hum. And I was like, I I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's awesome, but like, I want to know the stuff. And he was like, he knows his stuff and you'll have the best time ever. So yeah, we just paid Heim to hang out with us for five, six days, maybe longer. Like he was the most amazing guide ever. He knew his stuff. He knew the scripture that happened at everything. And honestly, and this is what I talked about at Gather the Nations, when we went to Caesarea Philippi, 
um, and we read Matthew 16. That is when my mind was just absolutely blown to what happened at this place. That's the gates of hell, right? It's Matthew 16. Um, mm-hmm. Cliff Notes version is there. Jesus and his boys are walking in, and it says, and, and they went here. You know what? I have a Bible. Yeah, I got it too. I'm ready to. Yeah, pull this, it up. I mean, this may be redundant for people that were there, but I still, it blows my mind every time I read it. Um, yeah, take your time with it. Like, uh, it says, the, uh, this is Matthew 16, 13. Preach. Now, when, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say, Eli- some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I'd read that story since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then being there. It says when they when they were walking into Caesarea Philippi. So uh, when you walk in, maybe you can put this in the show notes. I'll send you pictures. Like mm-hmm. when you walk into Caesarea Philippi, it used to be where the temple to the god Pan was, and that was in the middle. And on the on the right, they had a temple to the goddess Nymph. Out in front of the temple, the the temple to Pan, they had the courtyard of the dancing goats. And then on the left side of the temple, there was this huge cave that had water pouring out of it. And back then they thought that that cave had no bottom. And that cave was called the gates of hell. And they would do sacrifices and they would throw these goats. They would do human sacrifices. They would throw virgins in there and they kept throwing them in until the water ran red. And when the water ran red, they said that Pan was happy and they would throw this huge party. They say, I mean, since then I've come back, I've researched it so much. They say that over a million people would come to Caesarea Philippi to this party. And it was just complete debauchery. Like the, there was all, all kinds of sexual stuff going on with the temple prostitutes, with the goats, the sacrifices, it was complete chaos to this God Pan. Huh. And the name of the festival was Pandemonium. Right. It's, it's where we get the word yeah. for complete chaos. Right. And what's interesting when you look at that Pan Demon Em. Oh, wow. Pandemonium. So now think about this Jesus has taken these 17, 18 year old boys on a field trip. And he goes, hey, boy, hey, boys, who who do people say that I am? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm sure they're wide eyed. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, one of the prophets. And Jesus turns around and says, but who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven. I'll tell you the truth. You're Peter on this rock, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, right? Think about that. What he's saying is on in the, in the very midst of chaos, in the very midst of pandemonium, this is where I'm going to build my church Hmm. and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. And that's when my mind was blown because Haim was like, Jesus was a rabbi Mm -hmm. and rabbis never used like word pictures without being able to point to them. So he said for him to reference the gates of hell, he would have been standing right here. And like every hair on my body stood up and I was just like, (sighs) Oh my goodness. And that's where it's been like shit. So shifting for me is what, what kind of church did Jesus intend on building? 
he he wanted to give people the keys to the kingdom to go into the chaos and unlock unlock shalom in the chaos what christians have done especially here in the west is we've retreated from the world we've we've built safe places with walls around you know and and schools and like to keep our kids out of the chaos to keep our kids out of the world i i really I, i'll get in trouble for saying this but i don't care i i really think that we're just missing the point hmm. of what the church is hmm. and i think Caesarea Philippi is what unlocked that for me. Man. Wow. We want you to keep saying things that might get us all in trouble. So keep going, man. That's, you, you, <laughs> you, I got way more than that. Oh, you've yeah. Been, we're... You've been doing some, some beautiful things in gathering, speaking of gathering, uh, with some people in your community the past few years. And uh, I'd love to hear your story about how, how you're trying to live that out, what you just talked about, and trying to get back to yeah. – uh, like the, 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 the pure iteration of this thing that we call church. Oh man, that started, uh, I read a book called the forgotten ways by Alan Hirsch and it started a snowball in me. And basically what that book does is grab it. It pretty much graphs the growth rate of Christianity from Pentecost to today. And in the new Testament, it says thousands were coming to know Christ daily. And you fast forward to today, and we have the fewest amount of people coming to know Christ. And that it, it was just, it was devastating to my spirit because today we have the most resources, we have yeah. the most money, we Largest have the most, walls. most mega churches, biggest gatherings, most mm. Christian music, for crying out loud, all three of us. And the fewest amount of people getting saved. And I just started asking the question, like, well, what is, what's the problem? And I had this crisis of everything that I've given my life to for the last 20 something years doesn't work. There, you know what I mean? I, I know that that's a, that's a harsh statement because there are people that, have met Jesus in those environments. I, I don't want to discount that, but it's not moving the needle for bringing lost people into the kingdom. And what this book suggests is that we have lost the priesthood of the believer. Um, so when you read, when you read in first Peter, where he says, you are a chosen generation, a Royal priesthood, a people for God's own choosing. Like we read that as Westerners and we're like, okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks Pete. You know, but for them, that's probably one of the most revolutionary verses in the entire Bible. Because since Moses, these jokers have had to make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem, like every once a year, bringing their sacrifice with their family. You bring a bull. If you can't afford a bull, you bring a goat or a ram. And if you can't afford that, you bring all the way down to a pigeon, right? Like these instructions, you had to come with your family on this pilgrimage to stand before a priest so that he could offer this sacrifice for you, right? What was the priest? The priest was the representative of God to the people. And he was also the representative of the people to God. He was the, the intercessor, right? They did this for thousands of years. Well, then Jesus comes, dies on the cross, ascends back to heaven, sends the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. You know, now the Holy Spirit is indwelling people. And Peter writes this letter and says, oh, by the way, you're all priests now. The whole system is done, right? What? Peter did not say is, okay, now that you have the Holy Spirit, everybody needs to quit their jobs and you need to come work for the church and, and be professional Christians. You know, that's why Paul says in Colossians 3, whatever you do in word or deed, do that for the glory of God. So you combine those two verses. And what that means is if you're a, if you're a blacksmith, you keep being a blacksmith, but now you're a priest. When somebody comes into your blacksmith shop, you be the representative of God to them. 
and the representative of them to God, and and you tell them about Yeshua, you tell them about Jesus, the Messiah, right? If you're if you're a teacher, great, keep teaching, but be a priest. If you're a farmer, keep farming, but be a priest. Well, guess what? They understood that. And if everybody is doing whatever they do for the glory of God, then you know what's going to happen? Thousands are going to come to know Christ daily. Right. Right? Yeah. Well, you fast forward today, especially in the Western church, we've literally gone all the way back to the Old Testament. We gathered together and we listened to one priest mm. deliver the message, maybe two, if you want to count the worship leader. There you yeah. got two priests doing their deal, and then everybody goes home and does nothing. Hmm. And that, wow. that's what, I mean, people say this to me. Uh, Janet, I'm glad Janet's not here. My wife gets so mad when I say this, but <laughs> when people say, like, why do you think persecution hasn't come to the American church? My answer is because we are not a threat to the devil. He does not care. If there's 60,000 people gathered together on a Sunday morning, singing songs, take your shirt off, wave it around your head, he, he doesn't care. If you go home and do nothing in your community. And so that's like, I don't know. It's the most mind-blowing thing that, I, I don't know. Sorry, guys, I got way ahead. No, this is good. Jesse. I got way ahead uh, of my skis. Well, <laughs> since, since, well, since we, you described about when you started, you know, leading worship and traveling, uh, you've seen, you know, uh, you know, the birth of the worship movement to where we are today. So you, you've seen a huge shift in culture in the history of Christianity. It's, it's a big shift um, to, um, I guess, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's happened in cycles throughout Christianity, modern Christianity, but um, the shift of sharing the gospel, living it, to being a spectator, and where it's every every Sunday, it's a checklist where you hear a cute a lecture and you get pumped by a rock, you know, show for thirty to forty five minutes, and you go home and you do nothing. Um, did you see a shift like when it started happening? Like, like I don't want to get too deep into this, but I just got off the phone with Melody Green. Keith Green's wife. Well, hopefully we get her on eventually. Uh, oh. Keith Green's one of my heroes. Absolutely. And she, she yeah. told me, we talked about an hour last week on the phone, and and, and I, I love her so much. Um, she's in her 70s now and just a true pioneer. She said, Keith told me, he said, you watch Melody in 25 years. This whole this whole worship, this whole Christian thing, music thing is going to be a, a full-on industry, and it's going to lose what it, what it was. Um, and she's like, he was right, Josh. He was, he was right. Well, did you guys see that shift? Did, what did you see something like the domino effect? What started it? I mean, I, this is where I have to start treading really lightly. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, here, let me unpack it this way. The, here's the problem. Our enemy is extremely crafty. Okay, I'm just going to pause there. He's extremely crafty. And he can start sh making little subtle changes in your heart to where, you know, if you just get one click off course per, you know, six months, year, whatever, eventually you don't even know you're off course, but you, you know, you're trying to go to Canada and you end up in Guatemala. You know what I mean? That's literally what's happened. And so to your point, yet yeah, Christianity has been going on for this many years, but there has not been a celebrity Christian culture because back in the day, those were the guys that got killed. And nobody wanted that, right? So here's where, okay, I'm going to be very careful, but here is just a blanket statement about Christian music industry, about mega church, about, it. again, don't be mad at Joshua and Aaron, just be mad at me. I don't care. <laughs> he doesn't um, care. <laughs> um, 
I really believe the motivation for the beginning of all of these things was true and pure. I really do. I believe that on every level, the guys that are, are at the head started with uh, the mindset of John the Baptist, that I must, he must increase and I must de- decrease. I truly believe that was the beginning. He must increase and I must decrease. What success does is over the years, there's just little clicks off course. And eventually that changes to, I must increase so he can increase. In other words, like the, the bigger my platform is, the more I can tell people about Jesus. Right. Hmm. That doesn't sound like a like a bad thing. It right? doesn't sound illogical. No. You so you're like, oh wow, if we go do that and there's a hundred thousand people, well, I can tell a hundred thousand people about Jesus. Right. And so but it's a but it's a shift. It's a click, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that inevitably will have one more click mm-hmm. that is he must increase so I can increase. Subtle, dangerous, click. Subtle, dangerous, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's, you're building a kingdom, but it's not the kingdom of God. Mm. Oof. And I, I can say I've, I've, I've been there. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I, I it, that's an internal struggle with me. Well, and as you're saying that, I'm, I'm looking inside, like Lord. Where am I on, on this journey? Am I am I doing it? You know, am I centered properly that you must it's, I must decrease that you must increase? Right. And it's, it's uh, very subtle. And I can oh. tell you this: Aaron knows this about me. I'm at a point now that I just want to be around dudes that I like and that I trust. And mm-hmm. so, I can tell you the reason that I say yes to this is because I look at both of you dudes as guys that are still like pure hearted still like Jesus first. And that's why I want to, that's why I say yes to gather the nations. That's why I say yes to like anything y'all want to do. I believe in it because I, I believe you guys are pure at heart. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know, man, that got real deep. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I love it. Well, I was just thinking as you were given the analogy and I, I do love the analogy. I think it's, I think it's nautical, but I, I would imagine it applies to whether you're, on a boat or on an airplane or driving that if you get off course by one click and you continue in that, in that path, you're going to eventually be really far off course. Like you mentioned with the Canada Guatemala analogy, if we only compare what we're doing to what we just did one click earlier, it's not going to look that bad. And that's mm-hmm. going to make us really um, desirous of defending our current state like yeah. it's not it's not that is we're just we're just staying with the times you know we're just it's not and then you could argue you know well it's you know how inherently bad is it well it everything we've talked about it's not inherently bad but it could be really far off the original iteration the starting point yeah and i think that's the danger and and honestly bro my pendulum has swung so far that i once all this like started being like like my head started exploding and conviction and all that stuff. My pendulum went from like, you know, arenas and tour buses and all that to, I pulled the rip cord and just out of the whole thing <laughs> and, and went all the way over to like house church, like no sound system, no oh, production, uh, no preacher. We don't have a preacher at, you know, with what we're doing and, and there's a, and nobody gets paid. That's the number one thing about what we're doing (laughs) where, you know, we're multiplying house churches in Austin, Texas. We didn't even get there, but that's what we're doing now. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Cause yeah, cause you told me about this a couple of years ago and I can't stop thinking about it. So let's. Yeah, I had such an opportunity to see it in person. That's right. Yes. Joshua sit on the porch. Sit on the stay, king's porch together. With us. So how how was how did this how did this begin? Uh, right at this all at the same time. This was 2017. Uh, Janet, my wife, came to me and she said, "Jesus told me something this morning, and you're not going to like it." <laughs> Come on, I've I heard like, that before from my wife. I was like, yeah. 
Wait, what? <laughs> she goes, he told me that you have to quit going to church for one year. Wow. And I was like, what? That doesn't goes, sound yeah. like something Jesus is supposed to say. Right. right. I said, I said, what? And she said, yeah, he told me that you've been paid to be a Christian since you were 15 years old. And it's going to take you a year to figure out who Jesus is again. And I was like, okay. So we quit. We started reading the Bible together as a family uh, on Sundays. Uh, We started reading the book of Acts together. Got to Acts 2.42. Those that were of the way devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, the teaching of the apostles, and the prayer. Okay. And Janet said, why can't this be church? And I was like, feels pretty good to me. So... And you have kids at this time. How old are your kids in 2017, roughly? Oh, dude, you're going to make me do math. Uh, no. Well, Kay, w- Kay was born in 2000, so 17. Okay, 17. There we go. 13, and then my boys were 10. 10, twin boys, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, we started just like getting together with four or five families and eating a meal together and reading the Bible together and just discussing it and then praying for each other. Like Mm -hmm. one of our core values is everybody that comes gets prayed for by name every time. Come on. And also that, you know, we don't, we don't, nobody gets paid. So we started when this started, like before too long, like we had 60 people at our house and I was like, Oh no, like we, we've got to multiply or find an elementary school and, you know, and then just do the deal, you know? Right. So, which, which you were trying to not do the deal. We're trying like to not do the deal. The normal so, church process of building and growing. Yeah. Yeah. So, one of the main things we do after we meet, eat a meal together every single time, the way we start our gatherings at all our houses is we start with what we call Jesus stories. And that just looks like, hey, let's go around the room real quick and just tell of one time this week that you got to speak the name of Jesus to somebody. And the first three or four months of that was the most painfully awkward thing you've ever sat through in your entire life. <laughs> That's beautiful. I love that. I, love well, the reality. I would on. just, I would just let it be crickets. We would yeah. just sit there. People like all of a sudden have to retie their shoes, you know, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then slowly, like we I started being able to like encourage our people about the priesthood of the believer. And like, if you're not telling people about Jesus, who is like, just speak his name and watch what happens. Like literally just speak his name to somebody and watch what happens. That's all you have to do. And now it's, it's like part of our culture. Like it's, Every week, people are coming back and saying, "Hey, I met this single mom at the grocery store, and she can't pay rent. Like, can can we pay rent for her this this t- you know? Because nobody's yeah. getting paid. So, what I'll do every time is I'll say, "Yeah, we'll pay rent. Like, find out what it is. Okay, she needs fourteen hundred bucks. Yes, we'll pay her rent, but I'm not going to give her a check for fourteen hundred dollars. Okay. I'm going to give you a check for fourteen hundred dollars." And you're going to elevate your priesthood. Go sit down with her. I want you to look her in the eye and tell her that Jesus sees her, that he hadn't forgotten about her, and that he loves her. Come on. And then pay her rent. Come on. Guys, when you start having people that do that, it actually is a threat to the enemy. Yes. Wow. We, we've had so much attacks on us that it's crazy. You know, I mean, we could get into that, but like children dying, like, I mean, crazy stuff. Wow. So if I feel like we're, we're kicking a hornet's nest. Because you're a threat to the kingdom. Yeah. And the kingdom's kicking back. Yeah. And the gates of hell will not prevail. (laughs) They're not going to win. No. Yeah. They're not going to win. So yeah, that's where we are right now in the middle of that. Because I've left the uh, industrial Christian complex, like, uh, you know, like I, I'm never going to write another song that people are going to be, a, that will ever sing, you know, because, you know, I, I'm not with Chris. I'm not with passion. I, I've left all of that. Like, okay, God, I'm done. Hmm. I'm done. 
But if that's what you want, then just like when I was 15, whatever you want. Yeah. Surrender. If you don't want me to be a songwriter, great. Well, we're trying to encourage people on the back porch to speak the name of Jesus and having conversations with my buddy, Dustin Smith. And so we write a song together called I Speak Jesus. And literally the motivation was to get people on our back porch to speak the name of Jesus. And it's been crazy to watch the Holy Spirit like blow on that song. Yeah. To where now, again, at Gather the Nations, when I preached out of Matthew 16 about speaking the name of Jesus, yeah. walk off stage, and y'all went into I Speak Jesus yeah. in Hebrew. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, she literally Hebrew. just wept because <sighs> it's just so much more gorgeous to sing his real name. You know, when you were singing yes. Yeshua, I, I mean, even saying that the hair stands up on my on my arms, but... It's just the goodness and faithfulness of God is my story. And I feel like what God told me in through that song is that I have, through my life and through my career, I've put so much faith in man that I didn't know I was. Like, if I'm not attached to passion— I, I will never have another song that does anything. If if I'm not attached to Chris Tomlin, I will never have a song that does anything. And that puts the faith in man and the structure. And and, it, and I it, felt it, like, it, yes, I felt like Jesus said, I'm the one who's done this with your songs. Right. Like, it, if I like a song, I, there's nothing that can stop it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, man... Can you, can you, I thought about sharing this earlier and then I, I didn't, we changed subjects beautifully and I let it go, but I want to bring it back. Um, Ed, Ed Cash, um, worked with Chris as a producer, um, for a ton of songs and he's worked on some of my albums and I heard this story and I have his permission to tell it. Um, he's obviously, uh, one of the, the, the founders in the family of, uh, we, the kingdom now yeah. and in, in his own right as an artist, but he told me the story. This is probably back in 2012 when I was working on an album with him. And he was so, he's the producer. He's the guy who sits behind the chair, the, uh, the kind of like Oz from the Wizard of Oz. He's, he's pushing all the buttons and making all the sound. That's what a producer does. So and, he told us, and he can do everything everybody in the room can do better than they can do it. <laughs> amen to that, right? He can, he can sing, he can play, he can produce. Uh, yeah, everything. Yeah. And it's just one of my favorite humans. Anyway, go He's, ahead. Yes. So he he tells the story um, of uh, the moment that he first heard How Great Is Our God. Do you know the story, Jesse? You probably well, do. I think I'm going to. You go for it. Yes. All right. You go for it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief because I want people to hear you. Uh, you, can, you can tell me your thoughts after I tell you the story that he told me. Um, it, uh, up to this time, he had been doing music, some in the Christian world, but it was, uh, again, it wasn't worship. We talked about this earlier in, in this podcast. It wasn't worship music yet. It was artistic music. He was working with Bebo Norman, who we love, and like story songs and stuff like that. And he was not into the worship thing at all. And someone handed him this demo CD and said, you need to listen to this song. Um, we think there's, we, we think you could be great at producing it. And, and again, he had never done any worship. He didn't, he didn't listen to it. Didn't he, per his admission, he didn't care for it. So he said, I was here sitting in this room late at night, sitting at my desk, sitting in, my, in this chair. And I put the CD in and I listened to it. I kind of leaned back in my chair and he said, man, I was not into it. How, this is how great is our God demo that we're talking about. And he said, just in the quiet of this room all by myself, um, I said, this is just trash. And, you know, he was in a different place in life and whatever. He may have used different words, but he said, this <laughs> is just trash. And he said in that moment, and he said, I've never heard God speak, but this was the closest thing to the audible voice of God, whether it just spoke, whether he spoke to my heart or my soul, or I heard in my ears, I can't tell the difference. But, but he heard God say to him in that moment, how dare you curse what I have kissed? Hmm. And he said, I just wept immediately and, and, the, and, and, and realized, and, and, he's, and then he said that at the end of the story is that opened his heart to, this is something that God has blessed. This is something that God has kissed to use these words that came into his mind and, or mm-hmm. into his soul. And it changed his, his approach to worship. And this, I, how many times in, in the studio when I was 
in the recording process that I look up and, and Ed's hands were just raised in the air, worshiping like yeah. mm -hmm. a producer is supposed to be pushing buttons in that moment, but he's just mm -hmm. worshiping and entering into the presence of God during a recording session. And it mm -hmm. changed in that moment for his, for his admission. Um, what a beautiful thing for him, you know, in, in his journey, in his life. And, and you're saying that a, a similar, you know, experience with, um, with, I speak Jesus that you weren't yeah. even trying. Um, right. That's, that's exactly right. And that, yeah, that story's true with it. Uh, he, he told us no for producing a record because he thought worship music was cheesy. Cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, he's and definitely... how quick, how easy it is to criticize, right? And we can listen to a song. You know, I, how, how was church this morning? Well, I liked the first song. Didn't care for the second song. Hated the third song. Liked the fourth song. Like, whoa. Like we're so quick to curse what potentially God has, has kissed. Yeah. And it's uh, interesting because Michael W. Smith and Ed became some of the biggest names in worship music. And both of them thought it was cheesy at first, you know? Yeah. Um, and God still used them greatly. It's wild. Yeah. Jesse, we could go on and on and I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Will. Uh, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be at gather the nations. Tell us about that, Joshua. Gather the nations. Uh, I hope you guys can come. Last year, Jesse came, and we were so, so honored. You know, we at Gather the Nations, as you're talking about, you know, not making sure we elevate ourselves at, so that we can promote God more, and it's more about us less and God more. I still struggle with it because I just know that people don't want to be led by a board or an elder, eldership. They want somebody they can trust. And so for me, it's a struggle to, to follow this calling that God's given me to move beyond Joshua Aaron and be a part of a, a conglomerate of godly men and women uh, leading um, uh, a f the family of God. And I just believe, and I know that I know that God wants me to do this and just trying to live it out in the, in the clear way um, is always a struggle just to say, okay, God, okay, is it this, you know, just trying to make it as narrow and clear as possible what Gather the Nations is supposed to be. It's simply the nations in the last days, Jesus coming back and he wants the nations together. He wants them as one. Um, and, uh, into it, it, not, it, regardless to, to denominations. Um, and I just knew the best way to do that is just to sing and worship him and to have a, an environment where we don't have preachers that are there that are celebrity preachers screaming at them, just brothers and sisters up on stage feeling like one, one giant family. And I felt like last year was our very first one. You know, the, the, you know, the goal was to gather the nations, share the gospel and prepare the way for the King's return. And um, I feel like we did it last year. It was so much work. What a powerful team we had, especially behind the scenes. Um, and we had 1200 people in Dallas and now we're going to be in Orlando every year. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be on a, uh, very, uh, important feast, uh, that is yet to be fulfilled, uh, the feast of trumpets. Um, and I knew there wasn't much going on around the world on the feast of trumpets. And I just knew this is the, it just, it, it just landed like, okay, this is the time every year we are going to gather, literally gather the nation. So we had like, I don't know how many countries was it 30 some countries we had 49 states all 40, 49 of the 50 states were there um and jesse was a huge highlight aaron was a huge highlight and just really uh really jesse what was your feeling i'm sure you, it's not you've been to a lot of things is that something normal you're seeing or is that a little more unique than usual no, bro it was uh, it was it was mind-blowing first of all like all the all the things all the jewish things n now are so near and dear to my heart that and they're just rad like the dance circles like yeah, can we get you to dance next year that'd be pretty awesome i'm gonna pull you you did okay i did i gotta I got find video of this <laughs> i'll send you one i was like did you have I got, really yeah i was like i gotta get in that thing it's and it was the, it was the raddest thing ever that the shofars first of all i've been around shofars and uh what i do love is what you said is like, if you brought your shofar for the feast of trumpets, like you can blow it in between socks. <laughs> <laughs> we had specific times. Yeah. There was, and I mean, there it's was the feast of trumpets. You, they got to be able to do it at some time. You finish a song and it was like, Brrr, you know, and <laughs> it, it was just awesome. And then you had the one dude that actually was the professional shofar player that played him in keys. Yes. And that was <laughs> unbelievable hearing shofars in how great or in yeah, right, I speak yeah. Jesus. Like, oh my God. All those, all those things uh, were awesome. 
but I remember standing. So it was a, what, a three day conference. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you asked me to preach. I was like, sure. And I didn't know, like, when do you want me to like, you want me to do like a breakfast session? You know, well, <laughs> like I didn't know. And I remember <laughs> you said, I want, I want you to preach on the last night. Which is, that's the headliner spot, right? Yeah. <laughs> closing I, night, man. I remember like standing beside you side stage before that last thing. And I just had this revelation. I was like, he's never heard you preach before. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I remember looking at you going, bro, you've, you've never even heard me preach. <laughs> and you just put me in this spot and you looked at me and you said, I trust you. Uh -huh. And you know, before you continue, I, I, I've heard you say this to me before. And I thought, Wow, it sounds so irresponsible to me. But then I, I thought, I have heard you preach because your pen, your sermons are behind so many of the songs that we all sing. I have heard you preach. I, mean, I didn't care how eloquent you were going to preach because I haven't actually heard you preach, preach. But I've heard your messages and I've heard them through your songs. And that's, I think that's, I'm trying to justify. Uh, all yeah, that's a stretch, <laughs> man. That's, that's like, uh, <laughs> that's like, uh, going, going to a like professional chef and going, I bet you can farm. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's the same ingredients, but you know, the songwriting's farming. Anyway, uh, yeah, you said you said I trust you, and that those words went deep into my soul, and I mm -hmm. thought that's why I want to be a part of this. It's dudes that are listening to the Holy Spirit. That there's not an agenda. It's just like. Now I've never heard that guy, but I. Tr it's like when, when uh, you know, Mary was with Elizabeth and John the Baptist leapt in her womb. I mm. felt like I feel like when I'm with you two dudes, like John the Baptist leaps in my womb because <laughs> because the presence of Jesus is there. Oh, uh, and, and that's yeah. that's what I want to chase with the days nice. I have left. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I love. I know we got we got to conclude so, but I love. You know, I, I mean, I'm a little bit younger than you, I'm 46, and I'm in a season now where I'm just finding the friends that I, I know and trust and kind of not leaving room for new ones, you know, and, and uh, just only because there's so much hurt, there's so much distraction, confusion. Uh, but man, you know, when you find a good friend, you know, it's a good thing. And I'm so glad uh, I found Aaron, my bestie, but we were we're both so glad we found you and Aaron oh, was a big man, help gold. on that journey. Misha gets was a big help on that journey. And I'm so mm -hmm. glad I've added you to that list that you will not be erased from. And I hope I'm, I stay on that list yeah. of yours as well. Y'all are on. I mean, I, I went on a little tour with Aaron. I swore I was never going to play for anybody again. And then Aaron <laughs> asked me to go and I was like, dang it. Yes. <laughs> I, I like that guy. Like, <laughs> so Fun. yeah, Indeed. I'm in guys. Love I told you on stage, you remember, I walked out on Gather the Nations, and I quoted Ruth. Wherever you go, uh, I'll go. Your people. Your people be will be people. my people, and your God will be my God. And That was a moment. Yeah. I, yes. I believe it, man. Woo. I got the chills, too. I feel the, I feel, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. Ruth, Ruth the Moabites, the Gentile, saying to Naomi, the, the Jewess, I'm with yeah. you. And, yeah. and uh, that's how we feel. Well, if anybody's watching this right now, like probably by the time this, this uh, podcast releases, we'll be gathering in just probably just several weeks. So I hope you guys can join us. Gatherthenations.org as one big family. And that, was, and that was an hour and 11 minutes. So if you're still with us, God bless you. God bless. You, you, did That's it. Right. you have persevered till the end. Then maybe you can survive the three days with us in Orlando. Yeah, this is just a test. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jesse. Thanks for, uh, for coming on, joining us. And uh, we'll do this again sometime. And uh, we, we will see you soon, Gather the Nations in Orlando, Florida. Love man, you, man. I, just, I love you, dudes. Thanks for having me on. Love you thank too, you. brother. Shalom, y'all. Shalom. <laughs>